Hey everybody, welcome to tutorial 19. In this video, we'll take an introductory look at the Arduino platform and how it integrates with SuperCollider. Arduino is an open source hardware software platform for prototyping electronics, typically used for interactive projects involving sensors, motors, LEDs, etc. As far as Arduino boards go, there's a pretty big variety, as we can see on the Arduino website. For this video, I'm going to be using the Mega 2560 because that's what I happen to have on hand at the moment. As you can see, it's got a USB port for connecting to a computer, which I'll do right now. And doing this also powers the board, as we can see from the little lights that come on, which is usually a good sign. Once the hardware is connected, we can take a look at the Arduino software. You'll want to download the Arduino IDE and install it on your computer. And I'll put a link in the video description below. I've got it installed on my machine already, so let's open it up. Now, the basic idea with the Arduino platform is we code a program here in the software and then send it over to the hardware via USB, and then our code will run autonomously on the Arduino board. So what we're looking at here is a blank code sketch, and the language of the IDE is sort of a subset of C, C++. So it might look a little different if you're accustomed to SuperCollider, but there are some similarities you can see right off the bat, like functions are still delineated with curly braces and comments preceded with a double slash. And once we start coding, you'll certainly notice a few more syntactic similarities. So a sketch always contains two functions, void setup and void loop. When this program runs on an Arduino board, void setup gets evaluated once at the very beginning, and then void loop gets evaluated again and again indefinitely. And typically stuff related to initialization goes in void setup, and anything that needs to happen repeatedly goes in void loop. Before we start coding though, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to take care of. First, you go to the tools menu and make sure the board you're using is the one that's selected here. And in some cases, you may also need to select the appropriate processor. Also, you want to make sure the IDE is communicating with the correct serial port. In my case here, I want to select this one here. It says USB modem 1421. Yours might look a little different depending on your operating system, but it should be fairly obvious which one you should select. And if you're not sure, you can always unplug the USB cable from your computer and then go back to the port menu to see which one disappeared. And last, in order to compile and upload this code, the IDE is going to ask us to save this sketch. So we might as well take a second right now and do that. Okay, so before we connect any sensors, I want to write an exceedingly simple program just to verify that the Arduino and laptop are successfully communicating with each other. So in the void setup function, I need to initialize serial communication. This is done with serial.begin and in parentheses, providing the transmission rate in bits per second. And this is probably a good time to talk about accessing the help documentation within the IDE. You can click or highlight any class or method and then under the help menu, choose find in reference or use the hotkey, which in my case is shift command F. So here's the page for serial. And on the right, we can see the available methods. So let's click on begin. And the help file says for computer communication, we need to use one of these rates. And I usually just go with the highest one, uh, 115200, because why not? Now, technically, I think it's possible to go even higher than this, but we'll just stick with this for now because it's plenty fast for what we're going to be doing. And uh, while we're on the topic of helpful documentation, I'll also point out that in the file menu, there's a large collection of examples, which can be really helpful for getting a sense of the syntax and of what a typical Arduino sketch might look like. So then down in void loop, we're going to use serial.print, which tells the Arduino to write a value to its serial port. And we'll just print the character A. And that's all I'm going to do for now. So when we're done coding, we click this check button to verify or compile the code, which checks to make sure there are no errors. And then we click this right arrow button to upload it to the Arduino. Uh, notice that when the Arduino receives a new program, the lights on the board usually do a little dance. So I usually 
keep an eye out for that just to make sure everything is communicating properly. So now what should be happening, though you can't really tell by looking at the Arduino, is the board should be spewing forth a barrage of the letter A along the USB cable. And we can check whether this is in fact the case using a very handy built-in tool called the Serial Monitor. We can access the Serial Monitor from the Tools menu or clicking the magnifying glass button in the upper right corner of the sketch. And we see what appears to be gibberish. That's not the letter A. Uh, this nonsense is because the serial monitor is running at a different rate than the one we used to program the Arduino. And these rates have to match, otherwise the data becomes garbled. So that looks correct. The board screaming away with a ridiculous torrent of A's as fast as it can. <laughs> In fact, it would probably be sensible to have the Arduino pause for a bit between sending out each A, you know, basically give it some breathing room. We can do this by introducing a delay into the void loop function and providing a delay time in milliseconds. Once we've done this, we upload the code again, and this overwrites whatever code previously existed on the Arduino. So now in the serial monitor, we see A, once per second. So the Arduino and laptop are communicating. That's a very important step that we have now taken care of. So let's break out the toys. For this video, I have a half-size breadboard, a photoresistor, which exhibits a decrease in resistance as light exposure increases, a 10K resistor, and a few jumper cables. Let's talk about this breadboard for a second, for anyone not familiar with how they work. The outside of a breadboard looks something like this, with a whole bunch of holes. And on the inside, the holes are connected according to these green rectangles you see here. So this means if you plug some signal into, let's say, hole A1, you can connect to that signal through hole B1, C1, D1, and or E1, and then continue building or branching your circuit from there. Likewise, if you plug something into this long rail here, marked with a red plus, you can copy that signal by connecting a wire to any of the other holes along that same rail. And also a quick word about this 10K resistor here. Resistors come in a variety of resistances, and you'll want to use resistors that are appropriate for the sensors and circuits that you're using. What I usually do is search for a schematic diagram or a so-called hookup guide on the web for the sensors I'm using and make a decision based off that. For example, this diagram on adafruit.com recommends using a 10K resistor for this particular voltage divider circuit. If you happen to come across a random resistor, you can always determine its resistance by reading the color bands and comparing them to a resistor color code chart, like the one I have here. Now, it might be a little difficult to see clearly on the video, but the color bands on this resistor are brown, black, orange, and gold. And looking at the chart, brown and black translate to the digits 1 and 0, which gives us the integer 10. Orange is the multiplier, and that corresponds to 1,000. So 10 times 1,000 is 10,000. So that's how I can be sure this is a 10 kiloohm resistor. The gold band refers to the tolerance, which I think is how much you can expect the resistance to deviate from how the resistor is marked. So the resistance is probably close to 10K, but probably not exactly 10K. Okay, so let's build a circuit that incorporates this photoresistor. I could use the diagram here, but actually I'm going to use the schematic from this analog input tutorial on the Arduino website. It's actually exactly the same thing. I just think this one's a little bit easier to read. This is a simple voltage divider circuit, which is a very common thing to see when working with sensors and Arduino. We start at the five volt source on the board, connect it to one side of the photoresistor, and then on the other side, we sample this voltage by connecting it to an analog input. Continuing along the circuit, we go through a fixed 10K resistor and connect the other side of that resistor to ground. So let's build it. On the board, uh, find the hole marked 5V on the Arduino, and using a jumper cable, connect that to one of the rows on our breadboard. Uh, one of the pins on the photocell then goes into this same row, and the other pin into a different row. 
and then we connect this side of the photocell to analog input zero using another jumper cable. Then a 10K resistor from this row to yet another row. Uh, and ground this third row. So a jumper cable again, connecting it to a hole on the Arduino board marked GND. Uh, a lot of Arduinos have multiple ground holes, so it doesn't matter which one you use. So with the circuit complete, let's now write some code to digitize the voltage coming out of this photocell and send it to the laptop. We don't need to change serial.begin, that's fine as it is, but at the very top of the code, actually outside of the void setup function, let's declare an integer called value. Uh, this will be used to store the value that the Arduino reads at analog input zero. And you might think, well, why don't we declare this value in void setup? Why do we have to do it outside? Isn't that what void setup is for? And the answer is that if we were to declare it inside void setup, then its scope would be limited within void setup, and we wouldn't be able to access this variable inside void loop. So a declaration like this at the very top of the code is the right thing to do. Down in void loop, we will get the voltage at analog input zero with value equals analog read, parentheses, zero. After we've done this, we simply want to print this value using serial.print. Uh, in fact, to make this more human readable at the serial monitor, I'll use uh, print ln instead of print so that the Arduino appends each value with a new line. And then a small delay is probably a safe thing to do. So let's pause for one millisecond. Verify the code. Um, it looks to be error free, so that's good. Upload it. And now we'll check the serial monitor. And we have values. That's good. And as you can see, values decrease when I block out the ambient light, and they increase when I shine this flashlight onto the photocell. Okay, so now the last major step is getting Super Collider to listen to the USB port instead of the serial monitor. So first we need to quit the Arduino software because only one process can use a serial port at one time. And that's fine, because the IDE has done its job. We've written our code and uploaded it to the Arduino. So um, in Super Collider, we're going to start with a class called Serial Port. And we want to make a new instance of Serial Port and give it a name. And the first argument for .new is a string representing the name of a port. So serial port devices returns an array of available ports. And in fact, you can see this is the same list of ports that we saw in the Arduino IDE. So we can just copy the relevant port name and paste it as the first argument for serial port new, adding double quotes around it. And the second argument is the transmission rate. And this, of course, has to match the rate that we've chosen for the Arduino. And that's 115,200. And that's all we need for this line. So let's evaluate. Using this new instance of serial port, we can get values from the USB connection with the read method. So let's run this line a few times. And looking at the post window, a very reasonable thought to have is, what are these bogus numbers? They are totally not the same numbers we saw on the serial monitor, and they don't seem to be correlated with anything in particular. But before we jump to any conclusions, let's use an iterative process like do to get a rapid fire sequence of values from the serial port. Because remember, the Arduino is sending values out very quickly with only a one millisecond delay in between. So with this line here, we're essentially guaranteeing that the values we get into SuperCollider are, in fact, sequential values. And, okay, to be fair, this approach doesn't really clear anything up. It's still kind of a mystery where these numbers are coming from. However, at this moment, I want to go back into the Arduino reference files and look at serial.print. The key sentence here is, numbers are printed using an ASCII character. 
for each digit. ASCII is an encoding standard through which text characters are represented by numerical values. One of the quickest ways to understand what's going on here is to look at an ASCII code chart like this one. As you can see here, the decimal number 90 represents the character capital Z, and uh, 91 represents the left square bracket character, etc. SuperCollider has no problem decoding these. We can just simply use the method as ASCII. So with that in mind, let's run this code again, but we're going to make a change here. Instead of posting individual values, we're going to store the values in an array. And now the array X is filled with 30 sequential values from the serial port, uh, which we now know represent characters. So we can collect over this array and use the as ASCII method to convert each value into the character that it represents. And ah, now things are starting to make more sense. Uh, let's take a look at the unconverted array and compare it to our ASCII chart. So we have the sequence 55, 51, 56, which corresponds to the characters 7, 3, and 8. That's followed by the sequence 13, 10, which corresponds to a carriage return and a new line. Then this pattern of five numbers repeats, which explains the appearance of the converted array below. Now that we have a better understanding of how values make their way from the Arduino board into SuperCollider, I want to return to the Arduino IDE to make a subtle change. The main reason for this is uh, that we, we do need some sort of delineator so that SuperCollider will know where one value ends and the next begins, and technically we do already have this here. It's our 1310 sequence that represents a carriage return and new line. But I don't really like that there are two discrete characters to represent a break. It seems redundant to me. So uh, in SuperCollider, first we're going to close the port so that the Arduino IDE can use it. And back in the Arduino software, we're going to use print instead of println for our photocell value. And doing this removes our carriage return new line from the sequence of ASCII code. And instead, after printing the value, we will serial print the character lowercase a. Upload this to the board and in the serial monitor. Well, we can sort of make out a bunch of numbers and the letter a all jumbled together in a beautiful mess. Yes, it looks like complete madness and is not readable at all, but it also looks correct. So quit the Arduino IDE. Let's get back to SuperCollider and uh, re-instantiate our serial port object. And let's read a new sequence of 30 ASCII values and convert them to characters. And good, this looks correct. We've got a three-digit number followed by the letter A, followed by another three-digit number, letter A again, and so on. So uh, with this alphabetic character as our value delineator, we don't have to worry about dealing with the two non-printing characters that we had previously. Now this change I just made is not strictly necessary, but I sort of think dealing with only letters and numbers is a little cleaner and simpler when it comes to writing the code that handles this data. Um, speaking of writing code that handles the data, we've just been grabbing 30 values at a time, but now let's actually write a looping process that continuously grabs values from the USB port and converts them into usable numerical data. Because keep in mind, the numbers we're seeing in the post window, they are not actually members of the integer class. They are all characters. And mathematically and sonically, characters are completely useless, basically. We're going to have to find a way to convert characters into actual numbers. So anyway, uh, when we want some process to loop Routine is usually a good choice, which you may remember seeing in the middle of tutorial 17. So here's a new routine with a globally accessible name, uh, dot play at the end. Uh, inside the routine, curly braces, dot loop. So first things first, inside the loop, read the next value from the port and convert it into an ASCII character. And we'll call this value 
ASCII. Now, there's really no need for this to be a tilde environment variable because we aren't going to be using it outside of this routine. So we'll make it a local variable, which means we have to declare it at the top of the routine. Once we've got our ASCII character, uh, we'll need some conditional logic because what we do next is going to depend on whether this character is a number or the letter A. Using methods found in the care help file or char help file, however you want to say it, we can ask a character things like, are you an alphabetic character? Are you a character that actually prints something? Are you punctuation? Etc. So for example, uh, the character lowercase a, uh, we create characters in SuperCollider by preceding them with a dollar sign. Uh, character a dot is alpha returns true because it's an alphabetic character. But character four is not alphabetic. That's false. Right. So if the character we get is a decimal digit, then add it to an array. And let's uh, initialize this character array as an empty array at the uh, top of this clump, actually before we start the routine. If this character is lowercase a, then we know we've just finished a set of numbers. And so we want to convert this array of numeric characters into a usable integer, and then empty out the array so that it's ready for the next set of numeric characters. So, okay, how do we convert a collection of individual numerical characters into a single multi-digit integer? For example, if we have the array of characters 4, 6, 1, how do we turn this into the integer 461? Well, uh, this is actually kind of a fun exercise. So if you want, feel free to pause the video and try to work this one out on your own. There's probably a few ways this can be done. Right, so we want to wave a magic wand and turn this into this. First, we collect over the characters and use the digit method, which converts characters to integers. In the post window, it doesn't look any different. But with the class method, you can see that this array now contains integers instead of characters. Now, we can finish the job in the following way. Reverse the array, multiply each integer by 10 raised to the power of that integer's index within the array, and then sum the contents of the array, which, you know, is fine, but it's a little long, a little confusing, and definitely not as simple as the alternative, which is to use the method convert digits. Okay, so back to our routine. If we have a lowercase a, tilde val, this will be where we'll store the integer result, equals care array dot collect, convert characters to integers using dot digit, and then dot convert digits, and then empty care array. And that's it. So now we are actually ready to play this routine. So with this routine running in the background, val is being continuously updated with the value from the photo cell. So let's evaluate tilde val, make sure it's working. This looks correct. So uh, cover it up. And then uh, with flashlight, Success. Now, if you're sharp, you might have looked at this looping routine and thought to yourself, wait a minute, that loop doesn't pause between evaluations. There's no wait time. So it's running unrestrained as fast as possible. Why doesn't it crash the interpreter? Uh, in fact, if we take a look at the Mac OS activity monitor, we can see that SuperCollider seems to be not struggling at all. Now, if you spotted this, A+, plus, it's an excellent observation, and this fairly subtle idea had me stumped for quite some time. I think this is worth explaining in a little bit more detail, but first let's stop this routine. Okay, in SuperCollider, if you have a looping process and include a wait time, as we're doing here, you're probably going to be just fine.
if you don't include a wait time, SC Lang will almost certainly crash. Now, this might be disappointing, but I'm not actually going to run this code because it's a real drag to force quit SuperGlider, reopen it, reinitialize everything, especially with all this audio video recording software running in the background, and it might screw some other stuff up. So you can just take my word for it. This will crash SC Lang. You will have to force quit. It'll be a mess, and you'll be very sad. Now, this get values routine has a loop, but no wait. So why doesn't it crash? Here's my understanding, which admittedly may not be completely accurate, but I think I get the idea. In the serial port help file, there are actually two methods that read from a port, next and read. We've been using read, which is blocking. Next is a non-blocking method. So what's the difference? What is blocking? In this context, blocking refers to pausing the evaluation of the current thread. And in this case, the current thread refers to this loop. And it blocks that thread from continuing until it returns from the serial port with the next value. On the other hand, next does not block the current thread. It goes to the serial port looking for a value, but the routine keeps blasting away again and again and again as fast as it can. And depending on how fast the Arduino is spitting out values, port.next may come back empty-handed, or maybe the value hasn't changed yet, and it comes back with the same value as the previous one. So if we were to use next instead of read in this routine, then we would definitely expect SCLang to crash. But with read, remember that we included a one millisecond delay time in the Arduino void loop function. So let's say our super collider routine is running. We get to port.read, and port.read says to the routine, okay, hang on, hold everything. I'm going to the serial port, and let's say it gets there, and the Arduino happens to be in the middle of this one millisecond delay. So port.read waits and waits until the Arduino finishes that delay and gets to another serial.print line. Then port.read takes that value, brings it back to SuperCollider, and says to the routine, here you go, you may proceed. So this is actually pretty cool. We've got a small delay time on the Arduino, and using the read method in SuperCollider, we're actually able to carry that delay with us back into SuperCollider and implicitly include it in this routine. So that, I think, is why this particular loop doesn't crash SC Lang. Okay, so finally, we get to use these photocell values to manipulate sound. So here is a simple synthsef that uh, applies a resonant low-pass filter to a stereo sawtooth wave with slightly different frequencies between the left and right channels. And the cutoff frequency is declared as an argument so we can control this value externally. I've also used lag to smooth the cutoff values by a window of 0.02 seconds. And I think we saw lag in tutorial 15, uh, because if we use the discrete digitized photocell values directly, we might introduce some audible clicks or discontinuities or artifacts into the sound. So the synthef sounds like this. To control a synth using the photocell, we just need another looping routine that applies photocell values to the cutoff argument of a running synth. Here's our basic looping structure, and inside the loop, set the cutoff of the synth using our photocell value. The Arduino employs a 10-bit analog to digital converter, so val here could be as low as zero, and could be as high as 1023, but usually, almost always, this value is somewhere in between. As a cutoff frequency, this range of values is almost okay as is, but technically, it could go down to zero, and when used as the value for a cutoff frequency of a resonant filter, zero is, shall we say, an explosive value. So 
We don't want that. Instead, let's use linexp to map from the linear range, 0 to 1023, onto the exponential range, uh, let's say 80 to 4000. And then, as explained earlier, we have to include a wait time within this loop so that we don't crash. Uh, let's go with 0.01. Not so large that the photocell starts to feel unresponsive, but also not so small that SC Lang will work too hard. So all we have to do now is create the synth and play the routine. And when you're done, simply stop the routine and free the synth. And as far as the basics are concerned, that's really all there is to it. Now, this is just one analog sensor, but of course there's no reason you can't connect a whole bunch of others along with maybe some buttons and potentiometers, accelerometers, gyroscopes, you name it, and develop your Arduino code to handle multiple values. And, you know, maybe you could create some sort of miniature control surface or pseudo synthesizer. Uh, with Arduino, the possibilities are really, really vast. Uh, but thinking up cool projects for yourself is, is part of the fun of microcontrollers, quite frankly. Now, the Super Collider code in this video could certainly be modified and developed and made a bit more elegant. And obviously this sound could be a little more interesting and complex. But for this video, I wanted to focus on just the absolute bare essentials, only what you need to get everything up and running properly. As I was writing this tutorial, I was considering, you know, from here, rewiring the breadboard and showing off other types of sensors, but I was concerned the tutorial would get a little too long, that I'd end up repeating a lot of the same stuff, and it might also be hard to see exactly what's going on at the breadboard, you know, if things got kind of crazy. Uh, and maybe there will be an intermediate Super Collider Arduino tutorial down the road at some point. Who knows? Anyway, that's it for tutorial 19. I enjoyed making this tutorial, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope you got something valuable out of it. If so, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and subscribing. Uh, feel free to leave any comments or questions below. And as always, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.